everyone. Um, uh, so we were talking a little bit backstage and came up with a rough kind of order for our event. We decided chronological would make the most sense. Um, so I will start off by reading a little bit about, a little bit from Strangler Bob. Um, and then uh, Deborah will come up and read from Largest of the Sea Maiden, and Ninjin will come up and read from, I always forget this title, Triumph Over the Grave, yes. Um, I think I'm in denial of my own mortality. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's about it. It's a, it's an amazing occasion, a melancholy one in some ways, but a beautiful one in another to be able to uh, have this book from him um, at last. You hop into a car, race off in no particular direction, and blam, hit a power pole. Then it's off to jail. I remember a monstrous tangle of arms and legs and fists with me at the bottom gouging at eyes and doing my utmost to mangle throats. But I arrived at the facility without a scratch or a bruise. I must have been easy to subdue. The following Monday, I pled guilty to disturbing the peace and malicious mischief, reduced from felony, vehicular theft, and resisting arrest because, well, because all this occurs on another planet, the Thanksgiving of, the planet of Thanksgiving, 1967. I was 18 and hadn't been in too much trouble. I was sentenced to 41 days. This was a county lockup with its ground level devoted to the intake area and the offices and so on, and above that, two levels for inmates. They put me on the lower tier among the rowdies and thugs. Down here, the deputy promised me, if you sleep late, you'll get your breakfast swiped. The air smelled like disinfectant, something else that was meant to be killed by disinfectant. The cells stayed open and we were free to go in and out and congregate in the central area or stroll on the catwalk that girded the whole tier. This resulted in a lot of wandering around by as many as 20 men in denim pants and wor blue work shirts and rubber-soled canvas moccasins. A lot of pacing and stopping and leaning and sitting and getting up and pacing again. Most of us would have fit in perfectly in a psych ward. Many of us had already been there. I certainly had. My cellmate was an older guy, late 40s, with a bald head and a bowling ball punch, awaiting final disposition and sentencing. When I asked him sentencing for what, he told me, something juicy. My second night there, I overheard him talking to Donald Dundun, a boy about my age who had a habit of wandering the catwalk after lights out, climbing on the bars and propping himself in cell doorways, stretching out his arms and legs, spread eagling himself against the jams and suspending himself in the air that way and striking up idiotic conversations. My attorney already made the deal, I heard my cellmate tell Dundun. I'm waiting for a date to go to court and plead out to 25 years. I'll get released the day I start drawing my social security. If you don't mind me asking, Dundun said, what are you down for? A misunderstanding with the wife. Ho, ho, maybe you can talk to mine, Dundun danced away, ape-like, and left us alone. He'd been caught leaving a third-story apartment by the window. He wanted to stay in shape for future high-elevation work. The sounds of the cell block faded, the last stray remarks, the thumping and coughing, and the bunkmate below me said, you're the one they call Dink, right? I have another name, I said. I lay in the top bunk, talking to the metal wall inches from my lips. Not in here you don't. What's yours? Strangler Bob. <laughs> After a while, I peeked over the bunk's edge and studied the face below me, now only a black oval, like a fencer's mask. And because I stared too long in the dark, the face began to boil and writhe. The lower tier's standout resident was a young giant with a blonde pompadour hairdo and an urchin's face. Apple cheeks, fat forehead, happy blue eyes. The jailers called him Michael, but he referred to himself as Jocko, and the other prisoners did too. Jocko hustled around all day looking for somebody to listen to his opinions, or even better, arm wrestle him. He said he'd been in county jails here and there a total of 18 times, never for shorter than 30 days. He was not yet 21. This time he'd been arrested for giving a man some well-deserved punishment in the dining area of the Howard Johnsons, which he described as the wrong kind of restaurant for that. <laughs> jo <laughs> it sneaks up on you. Um, 
Jocko knew all the deputies and staff around the jailhouse. He whispered to me that the sheriff's wife, who worked downstairs in the administrative office, had many times propositioned him. He lacked any ambition or strategy for crowning himself king of the cell block, but he was nevertheless a star, and the lesser lights constellated around him. Zitsuckers, he called them. My first morning on the tier, I did sleep through breakfast, and somebody did steal mine. After that, I had no trouble rousing myself for the first meal, because other than the arrival of food, we had nothing in our lives to look forward to, and the hunger we felt in that place was more ferocious than any infant's. Cornflakes for breakfast, lunch, bologna on white. For dinner, one of the canned creations of Chef Boyardee, or, on lucky days, Dinty Moore. The most wonderful meals I've ever tasted. After lunch, most days, Jocko organized a poker game that worked as follows. Hands of five-card draw would be dealt out and the draw accomplished, and the player with the highest hand got the privilege of slugging each of the others in the meat of his shoulder with such a smack it echoed around the metal environment. Only half a dozen prisoners took part. The rest of us could see that damage was being done. I kept to the farthest margins. I stood 5'7 and weighed 120. As previously acknowledged, my nickname seemed to be Dink, not my choice. One guy I never heard addressed by any name. He had no friends, never said hi or what's happening. He spent hours shuffling pigeon-toed around the catwalk, his skinny frame clenched and twisted by inner tension, throwing punches at the level of his waist, as if pummeling an invisible child while whispering, you son of a bitch fucking pig, you fucking cop, punctuating his speeches with explosive sound effects like shh, blammo. He had signal flag ears, a chinless chin, scrunched forehead, his whole little face rushing out onto a really big nose, a regular beak, face like a Mardi Gras mask. After his episodes, he sat on the floor, rolling the back of his head from side to side against the steel rivets in the wall. The others watched him from a distance, but closely. I'll stop there. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to read a, uh, a short section from the story, The Largest of the Sea Maiden, which is easy to do because I think if I remember right, um, Dennis said it started as an exercise in writing very short stories, which he then strung together. So you can read one without knowing the others. This one is called Farewell. Elaine got a wall phone for the kitchen, a sleek blue one that wears its receiver like a hat with a caller ID readout on its face just below the keypad. While I eyeballed this instrument, having just come in from my visit with a chiropractor, a brisk, modest tone began, and the tiny screen showed ten digits I didn't recognize. My inclination was to scorn it like any other unknown. But this was the first call, the inaugural message. As soon as I touched the receiver, I wondered if I'd regret this, if I was holding a mistake in my hand, if I was pulling this mistake to my head and saying, hello, to it. The caller was my first wife, Virginia, or Ginny, as I'd always called her. We'd been married long ago in our early 20s and put a stop to it after three crazy years. Since then, we hadn't spoken. We'd had no reason to, but now we had one. Ginny was dying. Her voice came faintly. She told me the doctors had closed the book on her. She'd ordered her affairs. The good people from hospice were in attendance. Before she ended this earthly transit, as she called it, Ginny wanted to shed any kind of bitterness against certain people, certain men especially me. She said how much she'd been hurt and how badly she wanted to forgive me, but she didn't know whether she could or not. She hoped she could. And I assured her from the abyss of a broken heart that I hoped so too, that I hated my infidelities and my lies about the money and the way I'd kept my boredom secret and my secrets in general. And Ginny and I talked after 40 years of silence about the many other ways I'd stolen her right to the truth. In the middle of this, I began wondering most uncomfortably, in fact, with a dizzy, sweating anxiety if I'd made a mistake. If this wasn't my first wife, Jenny, no, but rather my second wife, Jennifer, <laughs> often called Jenny. <laughs> because of the weakness of her voice and my own humming shock at the news, also the situation around her as she tried to speak to me on this very important occasion, folks coming and going and the sounds of a respirator, I supposed, now, 15 minutes into this call, 
I couldn't remember if she'd actually said her name when I picked up the phone, and, and I suddenly didn't know which set of crimes I was regretting. Wasn't sure if this dying farewell clobbering me to my knees in true repentance beside the kitchen table was Virginia's or Jennifer's. This is hard, I said. Can I put the phone down a minute? I heard her say okay. The house felt empty. Elaine, I called. Nothing. I wiped my face with a dish rag and took off my blazer and hung it on a chair and called out Elaine's name one more time and then picked up the receiver again. There was nobody there. Somewhere inside it, the phone had preserved the caller's number, of course, Ginny's number or Jenny's, but I didn't look for it. We'd had our talk, and Ginny or Jenny, whichever, had recognized herself in my frank apologies, and she'd been satisfied because, after all, both sets of crimes had been the same. I was tired. What a day. I called Elaine on her cell phone. We agreed she might as well stay at the Budget Inn on the east side. She volunteered out there, teaching adults to read, and once in a while, she got caught late and stayed over. Good. I could lock all three locks on the door and call it a day. I didn't mention the previous call. I turned in early. I dreamed of a wild landscape, elephants, dinosaurs, bat caves, strange natives, and so on. I woke, couldn't go back to sleep, put on a long terry cloth robe over my PJs, and slipped into my loafers and went walking. People in bathrobes stroll around here at all hours, but not often, I think, without a pet on a leash. Ours is a good neighborhood, a Catholic church and a Mormon one and a posh townhouse development with much open green space and on our side of the street some pretty nice smaller homes. I wonder if you're like me, if you collect and squirrel away in your soul certain odd moments when the mystery winks at you. When you walk in your bathrobe and tasseled loafers, for instance, well out of your neighborhood and among a lot of closed shops, and you approach your very faint reflection in a window with words above it, the sign said sky and celery. Closer, it read ski and cyclery. I headed home. <laughs> Good evening. Oops. Um, it's really quite a thrill to be here. I want to thank all you guys for coming out tonight to remember Dennis Johnson, a great, great American writer. I also wanted to just share that I had the distinct privilege of having Dennis Johnson come to one of my readings before I even ever published a book. So I had won a minor prize for a minor literary quarterly, and he, Dennis Johnson, had attended. <laughs> And Dennis Johnson didn't really do readings, so I am so very, very honored to do one in his honor. So, <coughs> Dennis, we remember you. <coughs> I am going to read a little bit, a little tiny bit, from a really beautiful knockout story called Triumph Over the Grave, and I really hope that you guys get a chance to pick up this book and to read the story because it expresses so much of Johnson's tenderness. And here, um, the narrator is staying with his character, Link, L-I-N-K, who is very, very ill. And those are the two primary characters that you need to sort of know to understand this scene. Liz was the only woman that Link had truly loved. He confided in me many times, as his body and mind failed him in his deranged bedroom, with a dangerous wood-burning stove surrounded by the tottering stacks of flammable publications. I often observed him lying in bed, holding his cell phone in one hand, and in the other, a can of charcoal lighting fluid. His little trick was to stretch his long leg left and hook the stove's door handle by his toe, flick it open with a simian flare, and train an incendiary steam into the flames within to produce a small-scale explosion followed by five minutes of hard, bright burning. Poor circulation gave him cold extremities. And meanwhile, yanking on the phone with Liz, who lived in San Mateo, a hundred miles away. She and Link had been married and parted decades before. The daughter of Japanese immigrants, Liz, a black-haired beauty, even now in her 60s, had become in recent years a physically quite tentative and cautious person. 
with a ceremonious exploratory footstep because she no longer had any idea of where she was going or where she had been as recently as two seconds ago. Her memory and identity wiped away by Alzheimer's disease. But she stayed serene and cheerful and greeted everyone, whether a lifelong acquaintance or a brand new face, with a hug and a smile, saying, hello, stranger. <laughs> of the scores of family and friends who adored and supported Liz, in fact, of all the human beings in the world, Link was the only she recognized. And in this world, which is only now, she knows him perfectly as if they've just risen from their custom-sized king's plus-size waterbed. Oh, have I mentioned that he was six foot nine, a sliver over two meters tall? And the two of them, beautiful and young and rich from his many business enterprises. Liz didn't know her own husband, Malcolm, a retired U.S. Naval captain who sees to her every need and even calls Link's telephone number for her nightly. And nightly, Liz and Link talk on the phone and she pledges her love. And Link, who has never for a minute considered in his own heart and mind that the marriage has ended, drinks in these declarations and answers them with his own in the midst of a world without forward or backward, without logic, like the world of dreams. Thanks to Liz's dementia and Link's opiated vagueness and diabetic spikes and blood sugar, his occasional insulin psychosis and the cycles of delirium driven by the ebb and flow of toxins, mainly ammonia, in his bloodstream. Liz rarely left her home in San Mateo, but Malcolm was willing to bring her north for a visit. And she knew Link's voice. And we hoped that she would recognize Link's face too, though they hadn't been physically present to one another for many years. And Link vowed to me that he would live to see Liz again. Liz, of course, had no idea of any of this was being considered because taking her places was a matter requiring a lot of care and strategy and time Link was forced to count the days and to hang on. So for more than a week at the start of April, while he lay finally unable to leave his bed, stretched out to his full six feet nine inches, diagonally, diagonally across his mattress with his orange tomcat Friedrich asleep on his chest, a succession of storms, three of them, all of tropical origin had swept in from the ocean to do its violence. And now a fourth disturbance, not the worst of the crop, but impressive enough, had the crows of the hundred-foot redwoods churning in the gully behind the house. At least a couple of times a day, the house lost electric power. And in the chair by the stove, I would have to stop reading my book and listen to Link and his cat snoring between the thunderclaps. And in the middle of one of these out outages, about three in the afternoon, Link called me to his bedside and demanded to be brought to his room. I told him that's where we were, in his room. It looks like my room, he said. But this is not my room. Link, except for the eyes peering out of his hairless skull, looked no different than a corpse, but his thoughts were alive. And he wasn't always appropriately oriented. You had to be sort of careful with him. What does your room look like? It looks a lot like this one, but this room isn't the right room. Do you understand? This is not my room. So you want to go to your room? He saw that I didn't get it. As if translating each phrase for me into my hopeless foreigner's tongue, he then said, I wish to proceed to the chamber which is mine. <laughs> First of all, I said, I don't know where you want to go, 
And second of all, there's nobody here but me. How am I going to get you on your feet all by yourself? And as if gravity had been revoked, he rose to his full height and took three strides to the sliding doors of his bedroom. Link, Link, where are you going? And with a sweep of his arm, he pushed aside the glass door and the outdoors rolled into the room. He stood for a few seconds with the rain spitting in his face and he stepped into the storm. Should you ask, it never occurred to me to prevent him. I followed him into the dark afternoon and he stood swaying in the yard, which sloped gently for a hundred feet before plunging into the mile long gully that ran down toward the ocean, or rather down toward the roaring extinction into which ocean, earth, and sky had disappeared. And for a moment, Link took the full measure of something, perhaps of this shot of strength he had received. Then like a performer on stilts, he set his distant feet walking, steering himself through three kinds of thunder, and that of the gusting wind, and that of the drunken ocean, and the thunderclaps following the lightning. I describe the redwoods as churning, but their motion better resembled a towering shrug. But in a storm, the redwoods seemed to me punished, resigned, while the cypress trees seemed out of their minds, throwing their limbs around hysterically. And as I trailed Link closely through this trailing chaos, he in a Peruvian herder's cap, pajama bottoms, barefoot, bare-chested, under the long, ragged bathrobe open and flapping in the gusts, it seemed to me inescapable that he meant to stumble, march down into the gully, the sopping brambles and tangles, the thunder, the sea's embrace, and never come back. I was mistaken. He soon banked left and circled around the corner of the house to balance in front of his bedroom's back door, situated about 16 feet diagonally across this bedroom from the sliding doors that he'd walked out of. And the journey had covered 30 or 40 paces and lasted under 90 seconds. The weather was more wind than rain, and Link was spattered, but not soaked. And as he sloughed off his robe, lay down in bed, he thanked me for my help in getting him back to his proper room, and immediately began dying. Until the consummate hours, Link was able to hear me and talk to me, and I asked him if I should kill him with the morphine, and he said no. He preferred to wrestle with his torment, sitting up in bed, pivoting right and left, putting his feet on the floor, hunching over and rocking, curling into a ball, straightening out of the bed, lying east, lying west, no position bearable for more than a few seconds. More active in the single afternoon that I'd seen him in the last two months put together, and he wanted no help with this. As Link understood it, the doctrine of his spiritual teacher 9,000 miles away in India required him to live each incarnation to his last natural breath which came for him around nine o'clock that night in a long, gently vocal sigh. But before that, around seven, he spoke to me for the first time in an hour or so. Is Liz coming? I think she was coming about eight, I said. What are you doing? He asked me. Sitting Shiva? his last words. His fight gave out, and for the rest of it, he lay on his back, breathing like a sump pump with lengthy stops and convulsive snorting resumptions terrible to listen to, but only at first, and after that, a sort of comfort. An hour into his phase, almost exactly at 8 p.m., Liz arrived. She entered Link's bedroom by the back door, as mindful as a tightrope walker, measuring her steps against the void, assisted by her husband, Malcolm. And as Malcolm continued through the kitchen to join me in the dining room, Liz went down on her knees at the bedside 
and with her arms stretched out across Link's breast, her face pressed into the mattress. Malcolm sat beside me at the cluttered dining table, some distance from the bedroom, but with an angle of view on his wife. Even here on the other side of the house, and despite the dull booming of the weather all around, we could hear Link's respiratory system at work. In the high winds, the house seemed similarly unconscious but alive, the walls and the window panes trembling. Malcolm had gone to generous lengths in order to get Liz here for this last meeting and parting with Link. And just as he not only enabled but encouraged their phone conversations, pressing himself into these services out of some poetic inkling, I'm willing to assume some unbearable intuition of the rightness and even the beauty of the facts. He had a round, clean face, drained long ago of any sadness or happiness. And we sat side by side and said nothing, did nothing. After 45 minutes, Malcolm left me and entered the bedroom. And Liz stood up and said, Night, night, Linky. I love you. And she turned to embrace her husband of 25 years and said, Hello, stranger. And they went out the door. And I heard their car pull away. And 10 minutes after that, Link was dead. And the storm continued till about 3 AM while I sat by the stove and while the cat Friedrich made stark and the flashes of lightning marched restlessly over the boxes and bags and piles, there was nothing to be done. I didn't want to trouble the hospice staff or the mortuary people until morning, and there was no one else to call. Thank you. So as we were reading, I was thinking of something, I think, Deborah, that you've remarked on which is how Dennis's stories are the most requested when writers do your podcast, and in particular, the Jesus Son stories. And I wondered if you wanted to reflect on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's funny. I, I do a podcast where I ask writers to choose a story by somebody else that has appeared in The New Yorker and read it and talk about it. And I've had probably five or six people ask to do... Um, stories by Dennis and um, and talk about them with so much sort of love but without too much influence in a way on their own work you get the sense that they're full of admiration but not th not a desire to sort of emulate what he did but just a, a sort of sense that here's here's this person who was just one of a kind in what he did particularly in the stories from Jesus' son um, so he's a, he's a name that comes up, and I hate the term writer's writer because writer's writers are readers' writers, and they're everyone's writers, and, and there's, there's no such thing, really. But he is someone who can be particularly admired by people who spend their days working on sentences, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> um, I don't know. What, what, what's your thought on that? Oh, I mean, I think, you know, so uh, last fall I wrote this, uh, piece for Playboy on uh, Dennis Johnson and the writing and publication of Jesus' Son. And uh, I, as a part of it, went out to his archives at the uh, in Austin at, at the... Uh, Ransom yeah, the Ransom Center. Thank you. Um, I kept wanting to say Mishner, but, but it was Harry Ransom, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, who did that piece of things? Um, that was a lot of money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Ransom. Thank you, Mr. Ransom. <laughs> so um, it was, and and there's a story of like of the writing of the piece that was uh, apparent to me almost immediately, which was how often when I would try to speak to someone, uh, they were so cautious about talking to me, um, and. Uh, and how often they would refer me to someone else, and uh, how often it was about um, this 
kind of this circle of friends around him I, I discovered uh, that I was traveling through and, and in which he had been the center. Um, and, you know, many of them would say things like, well, you know, the stories are all true. Um, and then some of them would say, well, you know, he, uh, I mean, you could never say that about the stories. They, they, I mean, they're fiction. Um, and so there was this interesting, like, back and forth, this tension that I think he also inhabited willingly, even a little defiantly. Um, uh, you know, as, as he said in your podcast, or no, actually it was at Eat, Drink, Be Literary when he spoke to you about how he had this rule, I thought it was fascinating, that if he told a story to a friend, he could not write it down. Um, that was this, like, so for a long time, the stories of Jesus' son were just stories that he was telling his friends, uh, things that he had either experienced or someone else had experienced, and he was remixing them and telling them as yarns. And, and then, but he had this rule that he could, he could never write them. <laughs> and then he realized that he actually didn't believe this. And then he started, <laughs> <laughs> as he said to you, and then he started to write them down. Um, but I think that's part of the intense composition of them is this way that they were, that they were so often told orally first. Um, but uh, Deborah, you had the most experience of that. Well, uh, I of, of editing with him of the of the people here. I yeah, think, I didn't. Um, I didn't work on any of the Jesus' son stories, but um, I found that that Dennis was someone who, for someone who was so incredibly articulate in his work, was not um, particularly inspired to talk about his work um, or to question what he was doing or think about. I mean, he questioned intensively while writing. But once it was done, it was done. And I, I actually brought with me, um, because it's sort of entertaining, a couple of the emails he sent me when I was working with him on the story, Largess of the Sea Maiden, which um, my first experience working with him was on an excerpt from Tree of Smoke. And I think because it was an excerpt that I had sort of formed and it wasn't exactly a, a finely crafted story, it was something he had written as part of something else, he was quite hands-off with that, and we did, I did a fair amount of editing and shaping, and he even said at one point, Are you sure you want to end it that way? It seems kind of draggle-ended, and <laughs> you know, whatever you want to do, that's fine. So I had this sort of false sense of security that uh, working with Dennis would always be so easy. Um, and he sent, when he sent uh, Largess of the Sea Maiden, it was a story that was about 10,000 words, I think, and um, it's very hard for me to get <laughs> space for a 10,000 word story in The New Yorker. You have to wait and wait and wait for a, a very slow, thin news week. Um, and, and lately those don't seem to happen. Um, but so I asked him if he would consider, you know, just cutting the story slightly. I thought, you know, perhaps there might be some parts that could go or be tightened up. And of course he could do it in full in the book. And, and so I, I got this um, email from him. Dear Deborah, it's nice to be in touch. I sort of wanted to say hello again ever since that Q&A over a year ago at the BAM. Do you remember? So, hello, hello, Deborah. And now, the story. <laughs> I've been working on it too long to mess with it. Seven years or more. I believe every word is right. I've tried all the other words. All the words in the dictionary. <laughs> Even the weird placement of the introductory material, that's where it has to go at the end. I hope you don't think I write this way because I like being goofy and difficult. I can't give you a good reason for it, but it's not because I enjoy being incomprehensible to my fellow humans. What about publishing the tale in two parts? Would you consider something like that? So we, we moved on, um, published the story in full, <laughs> agreed to publish it in full, and um, actually went through a number of edits, which you know we worked back and forth on. And then um, I had the, the temerity to send him another proof, which was mostly copy editing things. <laughs> um, and I got this email. Dear Deborah, hold on now. <laughs> the way I see it, with that last edit, our work was all but done. The mind can only poke at a text a little bit. Further poking breaks the surface tension, and then the mind is just poking at the ripples. I want to set our previous edit exactly as I sent it to you. My dearest Deborah, to take this stance floods my veins with embarrassment. 
I'm aware it lands me pretty squarely in the crazy column. I can only assure you that when the mind-text relation gets ripply, I experience a corresponding disturbance to my instrument, my writing soul, that I've learned to treat as dangerous. If you think I'm crazy now, come see me after just a little more poking. <laughs> Follow the sound of the whimpering up the stairs to the farthest closet. I'm in there, curled up like an abortion. <laughs> so, needless to say, no more copy edits. Um, and, you know, it was always fun. It was, uh, one, working with Dennis was one of the more dramatic editing experiences <laughs> in my life, but it was, all, it, it was so much fun. I mean, getting an email like that in, my, in the middle of my day is fun. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> um, so... Um, Minjin, I'm curious about this story about Dennis being at your reading, which you must have been flabbergasted. Yeah. Am I right? No, it's like you're kind of mortified. Can so you say the name of the publication? Uh, narrative. Oh, okay. Narr so, but this is when narrative was not narrative. Like narrative was like a baby. And my dear friend Elizabeth Cathrell, who made Jesus Son as a film, and David Arudia, so the team made, uh, they were really very supportive of my career earlier on, and she had brought Dennis with him to mm -hmm. this reading, and I thought, it's Dennis Johnson in the audience. Holy shit. <laughs> you know, like I had that kind of thing, and then at the same time I thought, I'm going to try to play it cool. But, you know, how, how cool can you be when you're just starting out? So I was not that cool. And then he even came to the dinner. That was quite surprising. But, yeah. I was in shock. But can I ask you a question? I'd love to know what he was like as a teacher, because you studied with him. Mm. Yes. Um, he was, he was like a, uh, he was like this like could you have written lion. You know what I mean? Like, could you as a student have said, no, stat? Because <laughs> I, I just couldn't imagine oh, writing never, that email ever. But I'm I, Korean, so. A lot of him, a lot of being his student was, I suppose, being taught to think of yourself like that. Like to think of yourself as someone who could write that kind of email and stand up to uh, these kinds of folks, as it were, um, as a way of like just saying like, yes, this is how it has to be. You know, I remember the, um, there was a story that I had written uh, where I, you know, for I had struggled for a long time to write what I thought of as an actual short story. Because for much of my writing life, people would read things that I wrote and say, this feels like it should be a novel. And I would just be really depressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then started writing novels. But um, throughout it, I, I wanted to write stories, too. And in this case, I felt like I had really done it. And I remember he said, uh, in class, he said, this has the feeling of something, of like it's a match carried through the storm. And, uh, and that felt like the greatest compliment um, within the kind of context. So it was a lot of like, um, you know, not very, there, there was not a lot of uh, craft talk per se, as much as there was talk about like your relationship to your own ideas and your ability to just pursue them fearlessly and, to, and then to stand with them and to stand up for them. So that was probably more of what I got from him. Like this was when he was visiting Iowa? Yeah, it was, okay. you know, I, I had the great good luck to study with him and uh, Deborah Eisenberg, who was Annie much... Dillard. You had Annie Dillard, too. That was Wesleyan. But, was um, but at Iowa, Deborah was much more of the, like, she would return your manuscript with, like, all these pencil lines all over it, whereas Dennis would just make marks in the margins of encouragement, usually, or, like, question marks. You know, um, so they were very different teachers doing very different things. Deborah was like focused very much on specificity. Dennis was on like, how do you handle yourself with your idea? You know, both were amazing teachers. Um, but I think you know the it was interesting to sort of peel back a little bit as I did this uh, to see who he was at the time and to, th to think of like how at the time we were like, oh, it's the guy who wrote Jesus's son. But, you know, he had this massive career at that time as a journalist uh, doing, like, some really groundbreaking uh, uh, journalism and as a poet and uh, as a screenwriter and, and eventually later on as a, as a playwright. And he was really one of these rare writers who had uh, a kind of 
massive career, and so the he would have fans who would be a fan of this one corner of his work, maybe, or or three corners of the work, but they would never see the whole, usually see the whole thing, and that was an amazing thing to think about, like someone who was who was so polygonal, which I think was also my sense of him as a person, which was that he had this very sunny persona in person, could be very friendly. There's always a sense of shadows and things hidden and, uh, you know, I, th I think it was a, uh, a he was a, a, a wonderful presence that way. It was always very interesting, never, never dull, even when he was bored. <laughs> And funny, I think that's the other thing too, is as I was reading Strangler Bob, I thought he's actually very funny and we almost never talk about how funny he is in his stories um, amid all of the talk of like the, you know, the, the darker things that he writes about. There's so much laughter. You know how you said earlier that a lot of authors aren't influenced by him, but they love him? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? I think there are, you know, a handful of writers out there whom you can't imitate without it being just an imitation, right? I mean, they they do something so unique that you can't you can't you can't steal. Is it anything. the voice or the it's style? Do you think it would just be someone saying this is a Dennis Johnson attempt? You know, right. um, so. There was something, you know, like he said, he tried all the words in the dictionary and he found the right ones and they were very specific and they were very specific to him. Um, I, I think he, you know, there are other people out there and you, you can see that you can't do a George Saunders. You can't, you know, it's going to be too clearly an attempt to write like someone else. Um, so that, that's my, my feeling. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, there... Uh, I remember as a part of doing the the piece, I was reading all this criticism about him, and so much of it really seemed incapable of expressing what was truly uh, interesting about Jesus' son, and uh, and it all felt like all the summaries felt wrong, and it was a. I think people really were often s inarticulate with the joy of it, and even reluctant to analyze what exactly he did. So it was, people would often say it's singular, but they would never say why or how or what exactly he had done. And that was, that was a interesting effect, I think, of his, of his yeah. work and well, why he's I, I don't that. think he could explain it himself. So, yeah. you know, expecting other people to explain it is maybe too much. What I really like is the, is the kindness. There's so much kindness in his work. So even though he has had so much tragedy and suffering, there's all this kindness and there's a kind of lightness with all the dark, and it makes it bearable. I think in the stories in particular, you know, which I, off, I have come to over time think as very connected to his network of friends in a way, almost like um, various kinds of monuments, not so much to the friends themselves as to perhaps the events of those friendships or or something else, the spirit of them. Um, you know, I think uh, in the novels there was much more of the of the darkness, right? But anyway, when you we were should probably open it up to the. Oh, okay. yeah. I, I just have a question because you did yes. that research for Playboy. When you were, what was his process like of becoming a writer? Because I don't know that about Dennis Johnson. Oh, he was. Uh, when he was little, like, did he say, "Oh, I'm going to be a writer"? Uh, kind of. I mean, he w he sort of. Love to know that. He arrived as a. He went to the r the the legend about him at Iowa was that his father had sent him to Iowa, because that was where writers were supposed to go to school. And so he went there as an undergrad, not knowing that the Iowa Writers Workshop was a graduate workshop. <laughs> and so he um, he uh, and he was he published his first book very young. I think at um, if I'm remembering this correctly, at like 19, uh, his first book of poems and. Uh, and he got the attention of uh, Paul Engel at the at the at the Iowa Writers Workshop at the time, and who's creating the who'd create the International Writers Workshop. Um, and Paul kind of looked out for him, helped him find grants, and uh, you know, there's a really funny letter to his parents where he brags about um, 
how he read with Paul Engel and all these other poets, and he read the most poems because he didn't do any patter. <laughs> um, but he was struggling mightily with uh, drugs and alcohol and uh, his demons, as they came to be called. Um, and, uh, you know, he was married very young to, to a, a woman. He, in the letters, he called her Pudge. That was her nickname. Um, what every wife wants to be called. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, and there, is a, there is the feeling in the letters... Uh, of the, of the, of the story, some of the stories, some of the, it's a, you know, it was, as I was looking into the idea that they could have been autobiographical, I did look at his letters, um, especially, t he wrote quite regularly to his parents, um, and they were often quite funny, they had lines like, please send me your phone number someday, um, or, you know, like. Wait, the parents wrote that to him? No. He, he wrote, wrote that, that to, to his, his parents, pa yeah. Oh. Um, uh, it was, you know, it, it, his biography is going to be really interesting someday, whoever writes it. Anyway, but we should open this up if anyone has stories or questions. Feel free to raise your hand and I will uh, bring you the mic. I know it's tough to start things off. I, well, we have the, the uh, director of the movie of Jesus' Son in the audience. Yeah. I would um, <laughs> love to hear from her what his involvement was, how, how hands-on he was in that process. Well, I didn't direct it. I, I co-wrote it with my partner, David Derudia, who's sitting here, and, I, and we produced it. Um, and let's see where to begin. We, I read the stories in The New Yorker originally, and they blew my mind, and Paris Review and immediately sort of saw them visually and thought how it had to be a film. And we called Dennis and tried to get the rights first through his agent, and we were terrified. And basically a year later, we sent him a screenplay, and he loved it. He was so generous and kind. He said, you made something so difficult look so easy. And then he just came on board and fully supported us. He was a total joy on set. He kept saying, oh my God, this is exactly what it looked like. <laughs> this is exactly, this is it, this is it. He was like out of his mind, high and energized and thrilled and... Um, Literally high? No, 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 no never. No. no, he was, it was, that was all over. Um, and then he wanted to play a part in the movie and he did. He played the guy with the knife in his eye in emergency. He said, I want to play the guy with the knife in, in his eye because that way if I hate the movie, I can use that as a metaphor. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, he was just, uh, you know, and then he came out and really supported the film, which was amazing because he didn't do any publicity or very little. And he did interviews for us and, you know, came to film festivals and he, he really liked the movie. And then uh, Dave and I went on to produce his play, Shoppers, carried by escalators into the flames. Uh, which was killed by the New York Times critic, but we, you know, that that was that was a hard process. That play was really difficult because Dennis was done when he wrote something. Right, he was. It was it. It was over. Like there was no rewrites. There was no editing, um, and we thought the play was perfect, so that was fine with us. But it was a bit of a struggle, you know, here and there. Um, no. I no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. Does anybody else have a question, comment? Assuming you're all just uh, aching to get home and read the stories again. <laughs> well, if nobody has any questions, um, do you guys have any closing remarks or anything? Just take the book home and read it, um, and then go back and read everything else that you haven't read. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, it's a it's an extraordinary last gift to have this. Absolutely, it was Thanks. also a gift to have you guys read those stories. That was really fantastic. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for coming out as well.